Praise the Lord, everyone. It's uh, another evening of 153greatfish.com. Man, we've got a Bible study tonight. And this Bible study is for all of my Assembly of God friends. And I've got a lot of them. I was raised in that church as a young boy, all the way through middle school. But something happened to me. Somebody witnessed to me and showed me Acts 2.38. And this is what I want to do, is I want to return the favor tonight for all the people in the Assembly of God. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We bless your name, mighty God. I thank you for this day. God, I pray, bless all the people listening to this broadcast in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here we go to the PowerPoint. Spoiled by philosophy. That's our study tonight. Paul warns us about this. Here's our outline tonight. We're going to talk about the seminal word. We're going to talk about emanation from the monad. We're going to talk about theory of forms. And you're asking yourself, what has this got to do with the Bible? And you're exactly right. These are the three philosophies of Greece that came into the post-Jewish church and took it down and entered philosophy as scripture. You're going to say, well, I've never read these before, but you're going to soon see that, in fact, these philosophies are in the church, and they're in almost every seminary around the world. Can you say praise the Lord? Here's the warnings for the sheep. If that includes me, that includes you. Matthew 7, 15, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Paul said, Acts 20, verse 17 and 29, to the church at Ephesus. And from Miletus, which was south of Ephesus, Paul sent to Ephesus, and he called the elders of the church. Verse 29, this is what he said. For I know this, that after I leave my departure, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Jesus talked about wolves. Paul talked about wolves. And the church of Ephesus was the first place they were going to attack. Colossians 2.8, Paul warns, he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Yeah, philosophy. <laughs> it's in the church. Then he goes on to say, Vain deceit, traditions of men, the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. And then he says this to the Corinthian church, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your minds, not your spirit, your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. If it's not simple, it's not in Christ. So a grievous wolf means, you can get out your concordance and look it up for yourself, weighty, deep complexity, intellectualism, philosophy, esoteric language, and esoteric simply means the language of philosophers, it's not a spiritual language. It's simply complex. It comes out of Greek philosophy. It's esoteric. It's human. It's not divine. Oh, there we see the wolf leading the little sheep. And he's wearing something called the philosopher's robe. <laughs> We're going to learn a little more about that here shortly. First philosophy that came into the church is the seminal word. Who brought it in? Here's the guy right here. Here's At least that's what the... Uh, the artists think he looked like. Of course, they would never know. This is Justin Martyr. He was martyred, all right. In ancient Greece, a philosopher wore a robe to communicate his credentials. It's his uniform, the doctorate of philosophy. Many of you have worn the philosopher's robe when you graduated from high school or college. You had a black robe on. You had a mortarboard cap. You threw it up in the air when you were celebrated. Uh, that comes from Greece. That's the philosopher's robe. Those of you who went to college, you knew about the Greek uh, sororities. You knew about the, uh, the Greek fraternities. That comes out of Greece. The Greeks thought that the word erete, erete, was the word to describe the ideal man. And it was Greek paideia. We're going to talk about that too. Paideia that spread Greek philosophy throughout the world in one of the greatest empires that's ever ruled the planet. Justin Martyr, he was a Greek philosopher. He entered the church of Ephesus in 134 or 135 A.D. Now, listen up. This is the wolf. His name is Justin Martyr. 
He never took his philosopher robe off because it gave him a status over others. Can you say pride? <laughs> he wanted to keep that status when he went into the church of Ephesus, a church of Asia Minor, which had more Greeks than Jews. It started out with 12 Jews. Paul baptized them, prayed them through to the Holy Ghost, Acts 19, 2 through 5. This was 2 through 6. This is the church that Apollos planted. But this is the man that destroyed it. And how did he do it? With Greek philosophy, intellectualism. Justin Martyr said, Socrates and Heraclitus were Christians <laughs> because they were philosophers of Greece. And what he saw in their philosophy, he thought he read it right into John chapter 1. And this is one of the roots, seminal word, of the eternal son doctrine, which is false, versus the scriptural begotten son, which is found in Psalms 2-7 and Acts 13-33. I'd like to point out Psalms 2-7 prophesies a begotten son, that word means sired, a procreation process. And Paul talks about the resurrected begotten son. Even though Jesus was resurrected, he was still begotten. Can you say praise the Lord, sired? He had a beginning, a moment in time, and he was begotten in approximately 1 B.C., and he was born in 1 A.D. There is no 0 B.C. or 0 A.D., by the way. My month gestation. Then came the seminal word. This states that a word, oh, excuse me, this, I'm, I'm still on the seminal word, sorry. This states that a word is a subordinate entity with the same will as God, but was breathed. So in other words, it's just one breath. It's one word of many. It's only a portion of the full word. It's not the one true God. Thus, Jesus being the word that was with God, he's not the same as the full word of God, but he's a subordinate word like an angel or an apostle. Thus, the eternal son appears as an entity of life, but not the entity of original creator. In Justin's mind, Jesus is a God with a little g, and Elohim as angels and men are, and Elohim of limited domain, not all domain, not all power, not all authority, as Jesus claimed, but not as great as his Father. So Jesus is not as great as the Father. He's an, inter he's an eternal entity that co-resides with the Father God, but he's less than the Father. Now, people in the second, third century recognized there was something wrong with this idea, so they started to correct it. So Justin's ideas were weak, and they needed future doctors of philosophy. And they arrived to help evolve this philosophy into the final Trinity notion. And I want you to know that the Trinity doctrine was not complete until 1272 AD by a Catholic doctor called Thomas Aquinas. And he completed it near Rome. After the seminal word comes this one, this philosophy, the theory of forms. Here's a statue of Aristotle in Thessalonica. He's wearing the philosopher's robe, as you can see. And so the theory of forms comes from the book Allegory of the Cave by Plato and the Republic. Both of these books Plato wrote. It states that an idea of the mind is simply a word, it's a form, it's a thought, and it manifests, and that this is a phenomenon of shadows mimicking the form. That is, it momentarily portrays the form under different circumstances. Thus, Jesus is a temporary appearance of God. He's a visible shadow of God's reality. He's less than fully the Father. He's much like a hologram representing another. The theory of forms reinforce the idea that the fictional eternal Son is just one thought of Father God. He was with God, but he's not fully God. Thus, he is an eternal person living in a human person. And this is where we get the idea of two sons, an eternal person from eternity living in a her human person. And that's a mystery, right? They made this up. There is no eternal person. This makes two sons, not one. This is the two sons doctrine of Trinitarianism. And I'm going to prove to you tonight that there is such a doctrine. Emanation of the monad is the third philosophy that polluted Christianity. Now, the Greeks... They brought their educational and Greek values, and they changed the world wherever they went, behind Alexander the Great, who conquered the world, including India, Pakistan, all the way to the 
Asia, into Europe. Here we see Alexander, the young man, being tutored by Aristotle, the philosopher. And Emanation from the Monad Philosophy was authored by Plotinus. He was a second century or second century, second and third century century philosopher who brought us Neoplatonism. Now, Plotinus taught that there is a supreme, totally transcendent one, an essence, containing no division, no multiplicity or distinction. He's beyond all categories of being and non-being. This one is the monad, and he cannot be from any other existing thing, nor is it merely the sum of all things. The one, the monad, is the source of all emanations, and he first emanates as the nous. So the first emanation from the mind of the monad is the nous. That's the divine mind, logos, order, thought, reason in the beginning. This nous, due to having been emanated from the one, cannot be the monad, the supreme one, but is a subset of the one. And we see they want to make Jesus into the subset of the one. So Greek paideia crippled Jewish Christianity. Here you can see the breadth of the Greek empire. Look where Alexander came from, and look where everywhere he went. Next to the Persian empire, this was the greatest empire in the world, spreading the Greek language, the Greek ideas of Paideia. Paideia said, you must be educated as a Greek. You must adopt our philosophy, our culture. And, uh, of course, this created great problems, and uh, especially in, uh, in uh, Palestine, where the temple was. Greek Paideia cripples Jewish Christianity. The error from philosophical, and the word is metaphysics. Philosophy and metaphysics mean the same thing. Metaphysics is the Greek phrase for philosophy. The error of philosophical metaphysics as it concerns Jesus is this idea, subordinationism. This idea says that Jesus is an essence co-eternal with two other essences, but less than the Father essence he co-resides with when he manifests as a human. Otherwise, he is co-equal with the other two essences. You'll never find this in Scripture. This is a complete creation out of philosophy, metaphysics. Jesus as a man is subordinate to this trinity of deities, persons, which means personalities. This is polytheism, straight out of Babylon. What happened to the Jewish concepts of the one God? Notice that the Jewish concepts are rooted in monotheism and in the simple, plain words of the Old and the New Testament scriptures. But metaphysics makes it complex, weighty matters, a woof. Simple Hebrew monotheistic thought goes like this. Are you ready? You want to think like a Jew, like a Hebrew of the first century that formed the church? Number one, the one God does not create other gods. That is subordinate Elohim of lesser strength, domain, and wisdom. God cannot be co-equal with any other Elohim because he states that there is no other God beside him. Isaiah 44, 8, 45, 5. Go ahead and read those passages. One God is what came out of Judaism, not three persons. If there is an eternal son, it cannot be seen in the Old Testament scriptures, language, or descriptions. There was no Hebrew that had this idea in mind. Simple Hebrew monotheistic thought continued. God is a rock. He's unchangeable, indivisible, For Samuel 2.2. He's not capable of being divided into a co-equal triad of Elohim, each distinct as if a different thought form. And as to sharing the same substance or nature, no scripture states anything close to this. These concepts are clearly Greek metaphysical. And Jeremiah 10.2 says this is the way of the heathen, not the way of the Jews. The Jews understood Jesus' statement, I and my father are as one. They understood it as Jesus' way of declaring that he was the one God of the Old Testament. Thus, he used the Hebrew word Ishad. I and my father are Ishad. One, Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, the Jews did not have the concept of subordinationism that comes from the doctrine of the eternal son. They did not have that in their mindset. You can read John 10, 30 through 39. They didn't have that in their mind. But when they responded to Jesus' statement, 
What the Jews heard was that Jesus had made himself equal to God, but he being a man. Jesus was spot, responded and admitted that he said he was the Son of God, after he said that I and my Father are one, which means he's an appearance of God, he's the manifest human presence of the one God of the Old Testament. They had never considered this before, that God would manifest in flesh as a man. The Word was made flesh. That's what made Jesus divine. But being Christ and Son of God made him human. In other words, in Jewish theology, if God had a begotten Son, mean sired, as it says in Psalm 2.7, and God was fused as one with him, this is anthropomorphism. Now, you'll, that's a big word. And the rabbis hang on to that. Anthropomorphism, meaning that God was lowered into a man. This is blasphemy by Jesus. And they sought to kill him for saying that I and my father are one. That's the way the Jews thought about it. So, eternal son logos theology is f -f 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 from Greek philosophy, not Judaism or scripture. Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Origen, Athanasius, Constantine, Augustine, and the Cappadocian fathers used philosophy to corrupt what had been a Jewish church of Peter and Paul. Listen, folks, you never met any of these guys. They're not authorized to pen scripture, are they? I don't recall any Gentile penning scripture in either the Old or the New Testament. Do you? And this guy here is Greek, this guy's Latin, this guy's Greek, he's Greek and Egyptian, this guy's Roman, he's Greek, but he's a Greek Roman, this guy is Latin, and the Cappadocian fathers are all Greeks. I don't think they're authorized to pen scripture. The Greeks used paideia, the Greek concept, a paradigm of metaphysics. They tried to understand Jewish core concepts with metaphysics, and they created the Trinity doctrine out of it. The Son of God, nature, Christology. They created this idea that, the, that uh, there's two sons. The Logos and philosophy. They didn't use Psalm 119 to define the Logos. They used philosophy. They should have used Psalm 119, where those 176 verses use eight words to define the Logos. That's a Bible study. They were scholastic intellectuals, prideful and they said, we can define the mystery of godliness. We have the intellect and the wisdom with Greek philosophy to, def to define the incarnation. When scripture says something completely opposite, the Bible says, without controversy, Paul said in 1 Timothy 3.16, great is the mystery of godliness. It's a mystery that God was manifest in the flesh. Nobody can describe it. You can know that Jesus is God in flesh. But you have no words that will describe it other than the words that are in the New Testament. Jesus was justified in the Spirit. Jesus was seen of the angels. Jesus was preached to the Gentiles. Jesus was believed on the world. Jesus was received up into glory. This is the mystery of godliness. And here we got the scholastic philosophers from Greece and from Rome saying, we have the wisdom to do what the scripture says we can't do. That's pride, folks. And Colossians 2.9 says this. This proves that there is no eternal son because it says, for in him, Jesus, dwells all the fullness. When that word means fullness, it means all the word of God, grace and truth, all grace. He's full of grace and truth, all word, all spirit. He's the fullness of God. He's full God. All the fullness of the deity lives in Jesus bodily. How can you say there's an eternal son? How can you say there's co-equal, co-eternal persons? Let me tell you, here's some words you won't find in the Bible. Ready? Eternal Son. God the Son. You'll find Son of God, though, which is human, but you'll never find God the Son, which is divine. And, and I'm telling you, some of the new translations have corrupted their translations, trying to prove a doctrine that's in their head, but not in the autographs. Here's, here's some more words you won't find. Trinity. You're not going to find it. Three equals one. You will not find it. These are false doctrines, folks. They come from the Greeks. And I gave this Bible study to my friends in the Assembly of God because I know that they're very close 
to coming into full salvation. Full salvation. How do I know that? <laughs> well, what I'm trying to say is they're coming close to full salvation because all they have to do is believe that Jesus is the one God and take his name in the waters of baptism. Acts 2.38, baby. That's the plan of salvation. It's not found in Romans. It's not found in Romans. You can't get salvation out of there because the church at Rome was already saved. Written nearly 25 years after Peter gave the plan of salvation on the day of Pentecost. Well, that's where I'll stop. I hope I didn't offend you too badly, but I know that tradition is very hard to break, especially when somebody has planted a lie in your mind and then tell you that it's truth. They'll say, it's a mystery, just believe it. I had one preacher tell me, Dwight, I can explain the Trinity better than anybody. Well, guess what? The Bible says it's a mystery. How can you explain something that's a mystery? That's a total lie. Or it's, I shouldn't say a lie, but it's, it's a total delusion. That's what it really is. Well, God bless you in Jesus' name. I'm sure I'm, my mail account's going to get some email. Some of you are going to be angry. But let me tell you something. I am presenting this in love so that you might be saved the Acts 238 way. God bless you in Jesus' name.